Hello everyone. So welcome back to the series on process synchronization. So in this video, we'll be talking about uh, hardware-based synchronization methods. We'll probably look at uh, things like test and set and compare and swap. So yeah, in the previous video, we actually talked more about uh, the software-based solution, like the Peterson solution. So we saw how Peterson solution made use of uh, two variables like the flag and then there was one more called the turn. So based on these two variables, how it was able to actually achieve synchronization between two processes, that was kind of discussed in the previous video. Now in this video, we will focus more on the hardware-based synchronization. So we'll see what this hardware-based synchronization actually means here. Okay, so I think in one of the previous videos, we've also seen uh, what is a race condition. Now in that particular video, I'll maybe put a link somewhere at the uh, like maybe in the description. Uh, so in that video, we saw that the problem in the producer-consumer, so whatever producer-consumer problem we had. So in the producer-consumer problem, there was a case where the counter shared value, which was kind of being incremented and dec decremented. Now, if you guys happen to watch this, I think it's better you guys watch this to have a more uh, like better understanding of uh, this video also. So in that video, we saw that uh, there was this producer-consumer issue where a shared variable called counter was either incremented or decremented. So uh, this producer was kind of incrementing it and the consumer was decrementing it. Now this counter plus plus at machine level, it wasn't uh, just like a single operation. So at machine level, it was kind of doing load, then it was incrementing and then it was doing store. So it was loading this value in R1, the value of let's say the counter in R1, which is a register, and then it was incrementing R1 by one plus one, and then it was storing the contents of R1 back to the variable counter. Same goes with uh, counter minus minus, where uh, it was kind of loading the contents into R1, then decrementing, and then finally storing back the contents. So if you see at machine level, this one instruction is actually divided into three sub-instructions. So at machine level, it is not going to be like just increment, load, increment, and store. It's not doing it in one go. So there are three sub instructions which with which we can actually increase the counter value. Same goes with the counter decrementing also. So here, these instructions, whatever we see, load, store, and then the increment. So these are actually the hardware instructions. And this one is kind of your software instruction. So this is a, like, like at a high level, but when you go deeper uh, and uh, at the lowest layer where we actually talk to the hardware, these instructions are actually used. So when we say hardware-based synchronization, it is just that we are going to use some hardware level instructions, something like these. So these are also hardware instructions. Now, what kind of hardware uh, instructions are we going to use? We are going to be using test and set and components one. So these are two examples of hardware uh, like level instructions with which we can actually achieve synchronization. So we'll see how these two actually work. So this, I had to just write down to explain what is the difference between hardware-based synchronization and software-based synchronization. So the P Peterson solution is the software-based synchronization because we don't have direct access to the memory. Even though we ultimately go and access the memory, but it has not directly access like we do in load store operations. So even though it uses that flag and turn, it kind of goes and accesses the hardware, but it is not direct. So it, it is not like an atomic level. It will go and access through that load store. So that was like a software base. So in the hardware base, we will, we will be discussing more on these two now. We'll see how test and set and compare and swap can be used to achieve process synchronization. So let's talk about uh, test and swap now. So what is test and, uh, test and set, sorry. So what is test and set? So as the name says, it kind of tests something and based on the test, it will set something. So it is not actually testing anything here, but yeah, I, we will see like why, uh, why I say it is not testing anything. It is, it is just going to set some value, but yeah, still it's called test and set. Now, yeah, how this works, let's just talk about uh, test and set first. So what it will do is, so in the memory, let's say we have a memory and so some memory location, let's say X. So what it will do is, it will actually go and check the X memory location's value. And it will just set it to one. Now, yeah, maybe we'll just see an example and then try to understand what it's doing. 
So let's say we have a variable called log. So let's say this x was nothing but log. This memory location we are calling it as log. And initially this log is kind of set to false. Okay, so the value inside this is let's say false. Now this test ten set is a hardware instruction, which means this is a this is an atomic instruction. So what is atomic? So atomic is something like it is an indivisible operation. Now whatever we saw in counter plus plus. So counter plus plus was not an atomic operation. This was internally divided into three operations: that load, increment, and store. So this wasn't a an atomic operation. So atomic operation is something which will be not divided further. Like load in that case is an atomic uh, operation. So test and set is an atomic operation, which means it will be done completely or not at all done. There is no in between actually. So yeah, so step one would be to set this variable to false, and then we will actually call test and set on this lock. So this lock, what what does this now do? So this operation, what it will do is, it is just going to go and set the value of lock to. One, which is true. We can just say it does. So it will just set it to true. Whenever we call test and set on the lock, it is just going to get. Uh, I mean, it's just going to update the value to true. So even though it is saying test and set, it's not actually testing anything. It's just going and setting the value to true. Okay. Then, yeah. So now we'll just see how the critical section solution we can actually achieve using this. So we have seen that in any program. Uh, we will basically have four uh, like four blocks. So there would be something called the entry section. Then there is the critical section, and then finally there is an exit section and the remainder section. So we'll see how we will actually use this test and set in the code where we will put what and then uh, how do we enter into the critical section using this. So we will actually so whatever we have seen till this this is just an entry section you can maybe consider. So in the entry section, we are basically testing the log. I mean, we are just setting the log, but yeah, it's not just going to set it directly. So there, there should be some kind of check here. So what we will do is, if the log is kind of set, so if the log is not set, let's let's take the case where log is false. So if the log is false, this means our critical section is free. It is available. So log equals zero means it's unlocked. Which means the critical section is kind of free; it is available for use. Now, if lock is set, which means it is locked. So the critical section is locked, which means someone is actually already there in the critical section, and no other process should be allowed to enter into the critical section. So initially, we will actually set it to false, which means the critical section is available; it is open. So critical section is open for use. And then, uh, yeah. So the next step would be to actually. Check while the we will just call the test and set on the log. So what this will actually go and do is it will just set the value to true. So if at all let's say this was kind of true already. So if it was true, so we have seen that if it was true, then that means no other process is allowed to enter into the critical section. So if this gives true, we should enter in a waiting condition. So there must be a busy wait, which means we cannot enter into the critical section. So this part is your entry section. Okay. So if the value of the lock is actually set to true, then we will not enter into the critical section. We'll just keep waiting. If the value is let's say false, so let's assume the value was kind of false. So what this TAS will do is, so if we just look at this call, so TAS of lock. So internally it's just going to go and set the lock to true. And it is going to return you the previous content of the log. So let's say it will take the value. Okay, let's just write it again. So it will take the value of the log, and then it will set the log to true, and then it will actually return the previous content. So it will return the value, which is the previous content of the log. So initially, when the log was zero, and we tried to call this, so it returned zero. Back here, so it was like while false. So if it is false, it will come out and will enter into the critical section. So the process has access to the critical section initially, and since it was actually updated to one, now when another process comes and calls this, it will not be allowed to enter because it will uh, return uh, true here because the original value was true, so it will return true. It is still set to true, 
and since it is true, we will enter into a busy wait here. And then once the process is uh, like complete, when, once it has completed, the critical section will come out and then it will set the lock value to false here. So when this happens, lock value is set to false. Any other process which was actually busy waiting, this value will kind of now return true. And uh, I mean, it will return false because the old value it will return and then it will again set it to true. And now it will enter into the critical section. So this way, any process which is wanting to enter into the critical section will have to first test the lock and set the lock. If it is giving zero, that means it can enter. If it is giving one, it won't enter. It will just uh, keep waiting. So this, uh, this part is also actually called spin lock because this is kind of spinning around and this is like a lock. So this is just another term for busy waiting here. So this is how the test and set actually works. Now, if you see it as kind of an atomic operation, so it is just going, so it, if, if you see this, it has like a lot of operations inside. Like it, it is uh, setting the value. So it is actually taking the old value, setting it to one and then returning. Even though there are three here, but this will be done at an atomic level, which means this entire thing will be done together or it will never be done. So it's not like you do this and uh, somewhere at this point you come out and you say that uh, this value is set but log was not set to 1. Something like that won't uh, happen at all. So this is an atomic operation which means everything will be done or nothing will be done. So yeah, test and set, using test and set this is how we will achieve uh, process synchronization. Uh, I think that's pretty much it about test and set. So there's one more uh, atomic operation called compare and swap. So maybe we can just look at uh, that operation. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay. So we'll also talk about compare and swap now. So we've seen how test and set was uh, working, and uh, yeah, let's just start with the compare and swap again. So compare and swap, as the name says. It is also going to actually check for some value in the memory location and it is going to compare it with some other value and if the conditions match then it is going to swap with something else. So let's say again we'll have the same memory location, we'll also, uh, like we'll, let's just keep it same. So there is this memory location called lock. Now how this compare and swap works is, so let's just see uh, like the implementation details, like how, uh, what all things it is doing inside. So compare and swap it will return a bool, it takes uh, the memory location, then it is going to take an expected value and the new value. So what it is going to do is, it is just going to check if the value at memory location x, if this is equal to the expected value, if so, it is going to update the memory location to new value and then it is going to return true. Which means there was a successful swap done. If not, it is going to return false. If no swapping, it is going to return false. So this is how uh, this atomic operation looks like. I mean, internally it's doing this, but it is atomic, which means everything will be done or nothing will be done. So let's uh, just try to see the product, I mean the, the program structure, how uh, we will be able to actually go into the critical section with this. So initially what we'll do is, similar to test and set, we will just set the log to zero. So log zero means, False means critical section is available. So if lock is zero, any process can enter into the critical section. So let's just set it to zero. Now initial rate is zero. So in the entry section is where we will actually use this and try to see how we can uh, avoid any process to enter into the critical section when lock is not zero. So yeah, again there is this while loop. So there is a busy wait condition. So we will just check. We will compare and swap the lock memory location, we will expect it to be 0 and if it is 0, we will set it to 1. Okay, And if this is the case, if this is not the case, we will enter into a busy wait. So let's try and understand uh, what this is doing. So initially, the lock is let's say set to 0. So we call uh, compare and swap on the lock, expected value is 0, new value is 1. So since both the lock is also 0, expected value is also 0. So this is also 0, this is also 0, this is 1. So this is 0, 0. So this two, this condition is met. We enter inside. x is now updated to 1. So x is nothing but log here. So x is updated to 1. And we return true. So this value is true. And not of true is anyway false. 
So if it is false, it's not going to enter in this loop. It is going to come out and go inside the critical section. So lock is set to 1. We have allowed the process to enter into the critical section. Now let's say at this case, the process, there's another process which is coming in. Now it is going to, in the entry section, it's going to check for the same condition. So in the lock, we have a value of uh, 1 and we are expecting it to be 0. So here x is actually set to 1. We are checking if it is 0. These two aren't equal, so it will come out, it will return false. Not the false is true, so that particular process is now busy waiting. So once the previous process which is there in the critical section, it comes out, what it can do is, it can again release the lock. So it can set the lock to 0. So as soon as this process sets the lock to 0, the other process which was in the busy waiting, it will again go and check this. This x value, which is the lock value, it becomes 0. So as soon as these two become 0, we see that this, this condition matches, I mean it, it holds true. So it enters inside, sets the value to 1 and it comes out and then enters into the critical section. So this way we kind of make sure that no other process is in the critical section if there is already one. So yeah, that's how compare and swap works. The whole idea of hardware based synchronization lies in the fact that these operations are atomic. So if these operations themselves weren't atomic, if we could have divided this further, then again, there could be some uh, case of race condition, which we have seen in the counter plus plus and minus minus, if we did not handle it uh, in this atomic. So yeah, the hardware based synchronization works because all these operations are kind of like atomic. That's the whole idea about uh, process synchronization with the hardware based uh, instructions like test and set and compound as well. So yeah, thank you guys.